We welcome you to the media ministries of the Gathering Church in the Countryside YMCA of Mainville. As we love the Lord and each other, we're trusting that God would use us to plant the church in every YMCA around the world. To this end, would you join us? We meet on Sundays at 10 a.m. and in community groups throughout the week. As you listen to this resource, our prayer is that your love for Jesus would grow deep and your love for others would be seen and heard. I don't know about you, but um, I just sense just a, a great peace coming about over this whole room. Did you sense that too? Yeah. The Spirit of God is at work uh, in our church, and I'm so thankful. I'm so thankful. Well, happy Thanksgiving. Um, it's a, it's going to be a great week, church. It's going to be a great week. A lot of people are going to get together with family and friends. They're going to deep fry a turkey, bake a turkey. What, what are you guys doing, Leapers? Are you going to fry it? Or are you going to smoke it? You're going to smoke it. Okay, well done. Any other smokers out there? It's, sir, that was a bad question. It's a bad. <laughs> Why? It's my bad. It'd be a great week. Um, hey, as you guys prepare for Thanksgiving, um, especially dads, lead out this week. Lead out in prayer. Lead out in conversation. Lead out in service um, as you serve your family and um, and, and look to lead spiritually. It'll be an awesome awesome week. A couple quick updates before we get together um, and, and dive into the Word. Uh, the ladies had a Christmas party. Ladies, how was it? It was awesome. I, I, came, up, I came in towards the end. I heard a lot of giggling and heard that there were uh, uh, many frothers exchanged, uh, air plants, and what else? And chapstick. And ch- <laughs> Lots of chapstick. Very good. I'm glad that was, that was going on. Um, uh, yesterday, just kind of scrolling through the week and seeing God's faithfulness at work. Uh, yesterday, there was a, a funeral here for one of the um, women, who, women who lost the baby at the Y. And um, it was really, really hard and sad, um, but it was also a, a good time for the staff, the families involved here. Um, a few of us were there. Uh, I got to share the gospel with a whole bunch of people that might not have otherwise heard, um, heard the good news of Jesus. There's a new tree planted out there um, for a memorial for that little baby. It's a rosebud tree. If you saw it walking in, there's a bricks um, surrounding it, and they just did a really nice job. And so that'll, that'll be a part of uh, the, the story of, of, uh, of the Mainville YMCA for many years, and, uh, and I'm thankful that we were a part of it. Um, um, just to even share and open up our, our, our books with you guys, uh, we, we gave money as a result of your faithful giving to provide all the flowers for that. And it really just blessed the family so much. And that mama went home with some ridiculously pretty bouquets and uh, felt very blessed by you guys. So thank you so much. Um, the volunteer Christmas party is coming up this Friday. So if you haven't um, RSVP'd yet, go ahead and do that. It's 7 o'clock um, at the Lebanon YMCA building, like 1 or 2, I don't know, but uh, uh, it, it, the address is on that Evite. Check it out. If you haven't got it so far, just come talk to me, will you? Um, and I uh, would love for you guys to come. Well, let's get into the Word. Um, if you have your Bibles, go ahead and open to uh, the book of Mark chapter 8, and at this time, kids, you're dismissed. Ages 7 and below can head back with Miss Hannah and Mr. Scott Weaver, I think, is leading it. And anyone else? That'd be great. It'd be a party. We're looking forward to hearing how it went. Hey, church, this is uh, one of the most significant texts in the book of Mark. It's called the Jewel of Mark. And this is where we will see um, um, in uh, in summary Jesus' life, His purpose, His ministry, um, 
and a great call to all followers of Jesus and what it's like to follow Jesus. If there's one message that I would want you to hear from the book of Mark, it would be this one. And so I know that there's a few guests here. Welcome. You are coming to a great spot in the book of Mark where you're going to hear um, the heart of Jesus. And so let's begin our time. The title is called Lose Your Life. Verse 22 through 26. Um, we're just going to call it the illustration. Let me read it for you and then we'll go. The illustration, point number one. And they came to Bethesda, and some people brought to him a blind man and begged him to touch him. And he took the blind man by the hand and led him out of the village. And when he had spit on his eyes and laid his hands on him, he asked, Do you see anything? Now I'm in verse 24, if you're following along. And he, that is the blind man, looked up and said, I see people, but they look like trees walking. And then Jesus laid his hands on his eyes again, and he opened his eyes. His sight was restored and saw everything clearly. And he sent him to his home saying, do not even enter the village. And that's where we'll pause for a moment. I'm dividing it like uh, there, like this, and calling it the illustration because this miracle that Jesus does to this blind guy functions like a parable. It's a story. There's a, there's a meaning to it. Mark put it deliberately in this passage and he sandwiched it in between um, a part where Jesus, in verse 18, looks at His disciples and He, and he says, you have eyes, but can't you see? And then, and, and it's this message of like, hey, disciples, you're not really getting it yet. And then afterwards, we're going to see Peter not really getting it yet. Do you have eyes, but you can't see? This blind guy opens his eyes and he goes, I see trees. There's like, it's, it's strange, it's fuzzy. This two stage miracle is intentional. Jesus is doing something on purpose, he's telling us something. It is kind of weird though, like, what, what in the world, why this, this two part miracle where he's healed partially and then he comes back and he's healed again? It's meant to show us what it looks like to accept or embrace Jesus in part. And not the whole, not all of Him, not all of His message, His ministry, His teachings. Some people um, uh, during this time are getting it. They're embracing Him for who He is in, its, in His fullness, in His entirety. Some people aren't getting it, and it's straight up because of ignorance. They just don't know. But some people aren't getting it because they don't want to get it. Their hearts are hard, and they refuse to hear the whole message of the Christ. Which one is it for you? Is it, uh, is it ignorance? That's cool. I'm so excited that you're here today and you're going to hear the wholeness of Christ. Is it hard-heartedness? You want to hear the message that you're about to hear? Gradual growth out of just like the pathway of God and His patience? Or is our hearts, is, are our hearts hard? Maybe, do you, maybe you love uh, the miracles. You love the feedings. You love the benefits. But the story that Jesus is about to unfold, maybe you're not so, so much a fan of, so comfortable with the cost of following Jesus. I don't like that. I don't want it. Not so much. Well, we'll see about Peter today and what 
how He responds. And we're going to look at the disciples. But really, it's only after the cross, after the resurrection, that they finally get it. They're just like this blind man who received his sight in part. And so let's watch this illustration unfold in the life of Peter. This next point is called the confession. Uh, Look at verse 27 with us. And Jesus went on with his disciples to the village of Caesarea Philippi. And on the way, he asked his disciples, who do people say that I am? And they told him, John the Baptist, and others say Elijah, and others, one of the prophets. And he asked them, but who do you say that I am? And Peter answered him, you are the Christ. And he strictly charged them to tell no one about him. So Jesus, okay, he starts with, who do people in general, like, like all the crowd, who's, what's everyone saying about me? Who do people say that I am? They start with John the Baptist because they, they know that, that uh, his role was to prepare the way. And we learned a few chapters ago that John the Baptist got beheaded. And so like, what's the deal with that? Maybe you're functioning like him now in that you're preparing the way for someone else to come. Is that you? Should we, should we be waiting for someone else, Jesus? Or maybe maybe you're like Elijah, one of the prophets. Elijah was considered one of the forerunners to the day of the Lord. A a prophet, he comes, he precedes before this period of time that is unique to Scripture. And everyone's looking at Jesus, they're studying Him, they're hearing what He's saying, and they're going, something's different about Him. And so, should we be waiting for someone else or some period of time that you'll, that you'll bring about? Are you Elijah? Or are you just a prophet? Are you, are you predicting things and saying the truths of God? What's up with you, essentially? The people that are saying, maybe John the Baptist, maybe Elijah, maybe a prophet, They have half sight. They're not getting Jesus yet. They're not getting His identity, His full mission, what He came to do and accomplish. They're not getting it, and it's either out of ignorance or hard-heartedness. But either way, they're half-blind so far. And then Jesus, it's like the greatest question, says, but who do you say that I am? And Jesus answered him, you are the Christ. You are the Christ. The Christos in Greek. Transliterated in the Hebrew, you are the anointed one. The Mashiach. You're the Messiah. Peter looks at him and says, you're the one. You're the Messiah. We don't have to look for someone else. We're finding it in you. But even then, we got to pause and say, what was Peter's understanding of the Messiah? The one who would come and liberate our people from Rome. The one who would come with a sword in his fist, who would rule, who would judge rightly, who would sit on the throne of David and be our king. This is true. But just not yet. Peter was half blind. He sees trees, but not clearly yet. He doesn't get the full picture of why Jesus came. By the way, uh, non-believer, if you've never asked, or if you've never answered the question, but who do you say that I am? Who do you say that Christ is? Um, Every person must stand before God one day. And they'll be judged based off of your answer to that question. And um, one way the human mind will work is, okay, I'll learn the answer to that question, 
and I'll be prepared for one day to answer it rightly so that I can get to heaven, right? Um, but really, you, right now, in how you live your life, in what you believe right now, will answer that question. And so I'm so grateful that you're here today hearing what Jesus is saying to us and asking you, who do you say that I am? Well, he's about to unleash some serious truth. Um, and it's going to be really, really good news, but it's really going to be hard news. It's going to be, um, Peter would say, it's, well, this is pretty bad, actually, based off his response. So let's look at the good, bad news, okay? Let me read to you verses 31 through 33. Um, if any of you watched uh, the Mike Tyson, Jake Paul fight, anybody out there that watched it? Uh, Emsley, did you watch that? You're, you love boxing, don't you? I knew it, I knew it. Well, the, this, next, this next announcement, the good, bad like, like projection that Jesus is about to give to them is going to be like this three-punch combo that leads to a knockout. He's going to get him a jab. He's going to cross him. And then he's going to knock him out, Peter. And Peter's not going to know what to do with what Jesus is about to say. Let's read it together. Verse 31. He's going to fore foretell his death and resurrection. And he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer. Jab. Right there. Pah, right, to the, right to the chin. He must suffer many things and be rejected. Boom! There's a cross to the right eye. By the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed. There's the gut punch. Under hook, right to the chin, knocks Peter out. And after three days, rise again. And at that point, proverbially, I think Peter is on the ground KO'd, can't even process the, what? At three days, he, he just can't. Have you ever been in a conversation where someone is let out with something so like emotional or so like massive and great in news that you can't even hear the rest of what they're saying? Verse 32, and he said this plainly, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and seeing his disciples, he rebuked P Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan. For you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. Uh, let me just pause for a second. Um, this is the greatest news ever. That Jesus, the Son of Man, will come and He will suffer and He will die and He will rise again. Our God the Father deals with sin by sending His Son Jesus Christ to pay for our sin and to give us righteousness. And so that His wrath can be satisfied and we can be forgiven. This is the greatest news ever. But Peter can't quite see it. He's still half blind. No, Jesus! This is not the way! Jesus, get behind me, Satan. How about that? Our Lord, telling someone, everything that you said is so evil, it embodies Satan. He uses this term, the Son of Man, in this passage, um, and... Uh, it, it, it sets the tone for the rest of the book. Mark starts off the book, the very first verse, introducing the Jesus Christ, the Son of God. In the last eight chapters, he's proved to us that this guy is the Son of God. Even the Father looked down upon the Son at his baptism and said, this is my Son in whom I'm well pleased. I like Him. Listen to Him. But now, Jesus calls himself the Son of Man. And for, we're going to see this 13 more times in the book of Mark. I, I don't usually do this. It sounds kind of type A, but like, let me just, just hear me out. In 831, he uses it. In 838, in 99, in 912, in 931, 1033, 1045, 1326, 1421, 1462. <gasps> 
I mean, like there's, there is a theme that starts now that'll go for the rest of the book about the Son of Man. This isn't just like some cool uh, riff on Narnia, like Son of Adam and Son of... This is a unique title given to a special person from the Old Testament. If you would, if you have your Bibles, go way to the left to the book of Daniel. You're totally free to use the table of contents, okay? The book of Daniel, chapter 7. If you're new to the Bible, when I say chapter 7, all that means is big number 7, okay? Big number 7, little verse 13, little number 13. This is during one of Daniel's visions that he shares and he uses this significant title called the Son of Man. You've got to see it in the Old Testament. This is one of the most significant chapters in the Old Testament. I think I said New Testament sometime in there, but I, I did mean Old Testament. Forgive me, though. Uh, verse 13. If you don't have your Bibles, it's up there for you. I saw in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, so here's clouds of heaven, some dude, surfing on a cloud, coming on down, there came one like a son of man. And he came to the ancient of days and was presented before him. And to him was given, and watch all these powerful kingly terms coming, ready? Given dominion and glory and a kingdom and all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom one that will never be destroyed. Jesus introduces himself as, I'm not like the one that's coming on the clouds. I am that one. I am the fulfillment of Daniel 7. That's what Jesus is talking about. And so, of course, Peter is getting excited like, woohoo, all right, dominion, kingdom, power, coming on clouds, nations, control. Let's go. This is our time. Not yet, says Jesus. Expectations are being shifted. Eventually that will happen, but Jesus says, Actually, the path to get there is the path of suffering and dying and resurrecting. It doesn't, it doesn't seem like that from reading Daniel 7 with all this power and kingdom and dominion, which is the whole point of, and we've been, we've been hearing inclinations of it throughout this book, like, hey, I'm Jesus, the Son of God, and I'm doing this. Shh! Don't tell anyone. Hey, don't go to your village. Hey, don't tell your friends. It's called the messianic secret. And it's like, why? That's so against what we're feeling and, and wanting to do. Like, aren't you spreading a worldwide campaign about yourself? And Jesus so far is going, no, I don't want them to go and talk about me right now. Why? Because they're half blind. They don't get the full picture. If they go off and tell people, they'll tell them about me just feeding people, just healing people, and they'll for, forsake. They won't tell the part about me suffering and dying and raising again the most important part of my ministry. They'll just share the benefits. They'll just share the crown. Not the cross. But the point is that this must happen. The death. The bury. The resurrection. It's, it has to happen for you and for me. And so there's a shift in the message. We got the first half. Jesus is the Son of God. He's the Messiah. He's on board with that understanding but he's not on board with the second half, the Son of Man, the sufferer. Peter, in modern day language, would be like, whoa, 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 like, I was cool up to this point. Like, I was ready to go and just sell that Jesus. 
sell the feeder, sell the healer, sell everything. And now what you're telling me, Jesus, that doesn't sell. People won't like that. It's really hard. Change your message. I, I actually, I have a better idea. I have a better way of thinking that will go better for everyone. So just listen to me. I think, I think it'll go better the way I see it. Anyone like that? <laughs> me too. I've been there. Not embracing the Son of Man, the, the sufferer, the one who goes low in humiliation, um, the one who dies. Not following and embracing that Jesus has significant ramifications in your life. I haven't met anyone in, on this earth yet who has said, I want to suffer. So let's just be honest, right? This is not some like thing that we go, woo -hoo. This is actually really hard truths. It's not attractive and it doesn't bring the masses in. Yet it is the way of Jesus. It's his way. And then he's going to do this crazy thing He's going to invite us into the same path, the same lifestyle. And this path that he's going to invite us in has so many paradoxes that it's what it's going to take is for God himself to open your eyes to want it. That's that. That's it. Um, And he's going to show us in a little bit that he's so worth it. Because if you gain Christ, that's it. So you ready for the invitation of Christ? I was reminded, uh, Joe shared with me this, this story that a friend told where uh, his dad used to, used to pile all his kids in the car and he would say, you guys want to go on a road trip? And uh, the kids would go, where are we going? And the dad would say, somewhere crazy. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Joe. Uh, Jesus is about to pile us in his car. And he's like, hey, you guys want to come with me? You want to follow me? Where are we going, Jesus? It's going to be crazy. Let me read to you, starting in verse 34. Here's a big chunk of scripture. And calling the crowd to him with his disciples, he said to them, if anyone would come after me, here's the invitation, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake and the Gospels will save it. For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world yet forfeit his soul. And what can a man give in return for his soul? For whoever is ashamed of me and my words and this adulterous and sinful generation, of him will the Son of Man also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. And he said to them, Truly I say to you, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God after it has come with power. So this point here um, called the invitation is so countercultural. It just it flies in the face of everything this world has to offer and everything this world is saying to us and selling to us. Everything this world is saying of self-promotion, of self-centeredness, of, of build your own brand, of your self-image, of health, of wealth, and trouble-free living. This is an invitation to deny yourself, to lose your life for Christ's sake. And this 
This is hard. This is hard. It's a paradox. And if you believe it, if you believe that you, if you lose your life, you'll find it. If you give up your life for Christ, you'll be saved. Instead of trying to protect and control and preserve your life where you'll lose it. If you believe in this way, you get eternal life in a full and joyful life. You'll be saved. It is so, so counterintuitive. What would it mean to gain the whole world? Can we just land on that verse a little bit? Like in modern day terms, what would it look like to gain it all? Um, There's something that sociologists call the PMF index. PMF index stands for power, money, and fame. And all of them uh, are connected. If you have a lot of power, typically you're wealthy and famous. If you have a lot of wealth, you're typically powerful and, and people know of you. And if you have a, a, you know, a, lot, of, a lot of fame, usually money and, and, and influence uh, comes with that. And so there's, there's something called a strain of consistency with the PMF index. And so what would it look like if we just broke each of those down to gain the whole world with regards to, let's just start with power, okay? So if you were to gain the whole world with regards to power, it would look like some sort of position that has power over all the heads of the state, over every sort of secretary of state, president, king, any person in leadership over any country of the world, ambassadors, whatever, all put together, this person would have gained all of the the deciding power in that situation. He'd probably have to sit on uh, the world's largest corporate boards. He would be in command over all the 239 or 240 whatever uh, governments. And he alone, this person would have um, the key to economic and human flourishing in this country and in the globe. Power. What about money? What would it mean to, to gain the whole world in terms of money? Well, he would definitely have to be richer than Elon Musk, who makes two hundred and sixty three billion dollars. <laughs> That's what he's worth. It's a lot of money, right? But even more so, if this person gained the whole world, it wouldn't just be, he wouldn't just be number one on the top ten list of wealthiest people. He would have gained the whole world, all of its economic income. $300 billion would be his and in control. It's a lot of money, huh? What about fame? What would it mean if you gained the whole world in terms of fame? This person, you would have to be the truest, greatest celebrity of all time, whose face, when when flashed on a billboard or commercial or website, every single person on the globe would know. I mean, Dolly Parton has her own like city, like Dolly World. you know, Taylor Swift, everyone knows about her mostly like around here and Kansas City Chiefs and things like that. Trump, you know, one of the most famous people. But this person, it wouldn't even be worth mentioning Swift or Trump or Elon Musk or anyone. This person would, would have the absolute attention of the whole world. We would hang on every one of his or her words. He would be larger than life itself. So in terms of fame, that's what it would look like to gain the whole world. Uh, Question for you. You got any one of those? Power, money, or fame that you would like? Any one of those especially that you're like, oh, no, 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 not that, but... Actually, it might be a little bit nice to any one of those that like especially identify with you. 
Uh, you know, I've, I've, I've sat down with people that um, aren't, aren't that big, but feel like they're that big. I've had lunch with, an, uh, you know, and, and dinner with, with people that, um, that are on the way in their minds and hearts, um, on the path of trying to gain the world and power, money, fame. And each one of them, I've, I've found uh, them to, they themselves say, something's missing. They're empty inside. Uh, after Tom Brady won his fifth or sixth Super Bowl, he said, is this it? I mean, do I just keep pursuing rings and fill up my fingers? There's got to be more in life than this. These people that, that are, are, are gaining power and money and fame, they're climbing this ladder and the old adage is they get to the top and they realize it's leaning against the wrong building. When you gain the whole world and you're, you're seeking to do it in any of those three areas or all of them, you slowly begin to lose your soul, which means you lose your perspective on life, on relationships, on purpose, on priorities. You, just, you start losing it. About 10 years ago, I heard of, uh, I heard of the story of the wealthiest man in the world who was living at Sh in Shanghai, China at the time. Um, he was driving around the, the most expensive car there was on the market. Uh, just for fun, I looked up what is the most expensive car in the market these days, and it's a Rolls-Royce Rolls dovetail in rose color, meant to, um, meant to signify true love, like I'm truly in love with this car. <laughs> 30 million, 30 million for a car, right? This guy, so he's driving around the most expensive car in the world to buy. And uh, he's in the streets of Shanghai and he gets T-boned by a bus. Boom, bus wasn't $30 million. Bus was, well, how much do buses cost? I don't know. Uh, T-boned by a bus and, um, and his car wrecked just smashed to smithereens. And somehow, uh, driver's side, so it gets a bus into him, he gets out of his fancy car. And the bus driver gets out of the bus and looks at him and is like shocked at what he sees. And the, the, the wealthiest guy's like, what? You know, mad at his car, things like that. And the bus driver goes, sir, your, 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 your hand. And he looks down and his left hand from getting hit or, you know, whatever side they drive on, but his, his arm was out of the car and, and within the collision cut off his hand right about here at the wrist. And the wealthy guy looks down and he goes, oh, my watch. <laughs> Lost his perspective on things his very soul, to value a watch over his hand. That's how it goes. You start losing your life, your perspective. You start living for the things of this world. You're blind. This is, again, how the, the human heart thinks, though. And I'm, just, um, I'm not just giving a, a lecture here. I'm your pastor. And so I'm, I'm kind of diving into our, our very hearts and souls and, and anticipating the thought process going on, which could be something like this. Maybe I could just lose perspective for a little bit. Gain the world a little bit and then gain my perspective back and be set. So maybe like make a few billion. And then, and then, and friends, that's how we think, but that's not how it works. It doesn't work that way. Homer tells the story of Odysseus, um, a warrior that was, was returning home from, uh, from, uh, to the island of Ithaca from the Trojan War. 
and he was warned about these monsters that lived, uh, that lived on rocks and in the ocean and on islands, and they were called sirens. These, these beautiful women in appearance that would comb their hair and, and they would sing these beautiful lullabies, luring in sailors to, to, their, to their rocks, to their shore. And when, when sailors would hear of their call, they would, they would turn their ship and they would steer it on and, and their ships undoubtedly would crash against the shore and these monsters would devour them. He's told this, ready? They sit beside the ocean, combing their long golden hair and singing to passing sailors. But anyone who hears their song is bewitched by its sweetness. And they are drawn to that island like iron to magnet. And their ship smashes upon rocks as sharp as spears. And those sailors join the many victims of the sirens in the meadow filled with skeletons. And here's their song. Odysseus, bravest of heroes. Listen to the things that are attractive to you in this. Ready? Drawn near to us on our green island. So it's flourishing. Odysseus will teach you wisdom. Will give you love, sweet honey. The songs we sing soothe away sorrow. Anyone want their sorrow soothed away? And in our arms, you'll be happy. Odysseus, bravest of heroes, the songs we sing will bring you peace. And that is what power, money, fame tells you. That is the message of the world. In the story, the sailors are said to be, they, they put beeswax in their ears to keep the song of the sirens out. Odysseus strapped himself to the mast, which kind of the, 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 the hard part of the story, it's like oh, Odysseus, is, he didn't put beeswax in his ears. He wanted to hear the songs of the sirens. So he strapped himself to the mast and he heard them and he was bewitched and he wanted it so bad that his wrists were, were cut and bleeding and the ropes just tore him up. And he was like, sailors, let me go. I need to go. I need to but he was safe. Let me read you a quote here, though. This is by a guy named Ramesh Richard, one of my professors in seminary. Things that matter most, like matters of the heart, relationships, long-term issues, even after-life questions, receive the least attention in the middle of world-gaining and soul-losing. So let me ask you just two questions, and, and we just have them on the screen for you. These are questions to ponder, internalize, come to the Lord with, and they would be this. Is the seen as important as the unseen? Is the temporal as important as the eternal? And when you come to this text, it's a fork in the road. Will you follow the Son of Man? Are you willing to follow the same path that He did? One of hardship, trials, suffering, even death. What's your option? You could pursue the other path, which will lead to death. Or you could choose to lose your life in order to find it. So my urge to you this morning from God's Word would be to strap yourself to the mast of Christ. Tie yourself to Him. Not to listen at all. Put beeswax in your ears to the ways and the teachings of the world that will lure you in only to lead to your ship crashing against the rocks. Hear the whole message of Christ, the Son of God and the Son of Man, that the road to glory comes through denying yourself, taking up your cross, and following Him. Let's pray.
So, Father, teach us. Teach us what it looks like to lay down our lives for you. Teach us what it means to pick up our cross and follow you daily. Lord, help us to lose our lives, our name, our, our legacy, to lose it all for the sake of Jesus Christ. You know that one missionary said to live for Christ, to die and be forgotten. Lord, may that be our prayer and our, 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 the fruit of our lives in this church, Lord that we would live for you alone and die and be forgotten. And that the legacy and the name of Jesus would be our only pride, joy, crown, desire, pursuit. It's him we love. On the night before Jesus was, was taken, uh, beaten, bruised, and then later crucified and uh, buried the next day. Uh, he brought his disciples in, and they, they now heard the full message of Jesus. Some were half blind, and some were in it. Some were all in. And they said, they, 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 they heard the message of Jesus, and, and, which was that you need to have an observance of me to, to make it through. This is not an easy call by any means. You have to daily come to me. You have to eat of me. You have to drink of me. You have to be right with me. And so he instituted what's called the Lord's Table or Communion. Some call it the Eucharist, which just means to a, a, a give thanks. And the bread and the cup in and of themselves don't have any power in you or over you. But it's a way to remember that you can go to Jesus and be fed and forgiven. And friends, this is the only way that you're going to be able to deny yourself and to pick up your cross and if I, sure you could you could deny yourself for a day and tell your wife sure i'll do the dishes but inside you're just angry and bitter about something but to please god and serve him and love him and to be not self-centered you need jesus himself to come in and transform you this is the, the path less followed, as Jack Frost would say. But this is the path that leads to great joy and eternal life. Would you pray? Ask God to forgive your sins. Then we want to welcome you to the table. And come like fervently, expectantly, wanting to be fed and nourished by Him alone because this is the only way it's gonna happen. So let's take some time in prayer, and when you're ready, come on up. If you have not received Christ, if you're not a Christian, we'd ask that you'd let the bread and the cup pass. In addition, if you're withholding forgiveness from anyone, if, there is, if, if you have a relationship that has not been brought together or reconciled, we also ask that you would withhold from taking the bread or cup because forgiveness is the hallmark of Christianity. And so let's take some time and come to him.